Well, I first started looking at the issue of manhood when some men in my church approached me and basically said, we need to do something for the men. They were looking for something uh, honestly a little deeper, a little rawer. And then I think there were a number of issues that guys wanted to talk about that they didn't feel like were addressed in church. That's what kind of spurred me to begin to research and explore at a deeper level what it really means to be a man. One of the great aha moments was that suddenly, as I looked at the Bible, two men just jumped out of the text and interestingly featured one at the very first part of the Old Testament and the other featured at the first part of the New Testament. That was a huge aha because I thought, well, if I took these two supreme kind of archetypes of masculinity, could I somehow come up with a definition of manhood that would be universal for all men, at least they could use it in a practical sense. As you take these two men and compare them together, there's some things that fall out the bottom that I think give us a very simple but compelling definition of masculinity. When you look at the first Adam, here he was placed in a garden and he was asked as any man to take leadership of that and be aggressive in it. And yet when the first threat came to that leadership in the garden from the serpent, rather than be a man, be active, he shrunk back in an infection that now infects all men, and that's passivity. But when we look at the second man who, without being sacrilegious, was in the comfort of heaven, as he looked at how sin was ravaging humanity, rather than being passive and just enjoying it as a spectator, he stepped up and actively did what real men do, and that is invade the issue. So one of the first things that I see as I compare these two men was one fell into passivity, the other rejected passivity. 